Welcome to Oklahoma Gardening. Stay tuned as I share with you about No Mow May. We then head over to Woodward Park in Tulsa to catch up with Mark Bays about tree decay and learn about low and high tech methods used for detection. Dr. Andrine Shufran introduces us to a new insect. And finally, we make a stop at the newest addition to Oklahoma City's Scissor Tell Park. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. So if you're looking for an easy, low-maintenance perennial, have two different types of flowers on one plant. Face noise that gives the pepper its heat. During the spring, a lot of times our garden can be a little slow to get started and allow for all of those flowers to be available for pollinators. However, you probably have seen the wildflowers and sometimes even those lawn weeds um, blooming early in the season. Those can all provide great forage for a lot of our pollinators, whether they're migrating through or they're just coming out and they're starting to look for those forage plants. While we've talked previously with the Department of Transportation, the Oklahoma Department of Transportation, about their mowing practices, and they've actually reduced some of their mowing to allow for those wildflowers to be available for those pollinators, that practice doesn't just have to be limited to the roadsides. In fact, it's something that you could do in your own front yard by not mowing quite as often. In fact, there's one campaign that's starting to sweep across the nation called No Mow May. If you haven't heard about it, it's something you might want to check out. In fact, it's the idea that in the month of May that you don't mow or maybe you don't mow quite as often. You can see here at the Botanic Gardens, we've kind of allowed our lawn area to not be mowed. And you can see we've got several different um, plants that are blooming, especially the white clover, which is a legume. So it's not only beneficial for the pollinators, but it's also beneficial for the soil. Of course, you want to make sure to check with your local ordinances, both your city and also your homeowners association, just to make sure that you're not breaking any rules that might be in place. But by allowing your lawn to grow, you'll see that you'll get a few more flowers. Maybe whether you're a gardener or not, you'll have those flowers avail available for those pollinators. Now, if there are some rules that are in place or you want to make sure that it just doesn't look unkept, because sometimes when things aren't mowed, it can have that look, not only can you download PDFs and make your own sign for your yard, but you can also adjust your mowing pattern to make it a little more intentional. So maybe you don't want to go the whole month without mowing, but maybe you stretch the mowing schedule a little bit, allowing for those um, flowering weeds to grow a little bit taller before you cut them down. Another option is to mow a border around your lawn. Just by having a mowed border around the unmowed area will make that area look a little more intentional. So if you're looking for an excuse to ease back into your summer mowing routine, give yourself a break while allowing those pollinators a little extra forage by adopting No Mow May. Today we are here at Woodward Park, joined by Mark Bays, and actually many other arborists are out here as well for a workshop specifically about tree decay, right? Yeah, there's, uh, this spring has really been a hard year for trees in Oklahoma. We've had the tornadoes come through and ravage a lot of trees, but even it's so windy uh, in Oklahoma, mm -hmm. we do see a lot of problems with trees sometimes failing in high winds. One of the things we're learning about today is decay in trees. And so, I mean, homeowners obviously have concerns, especially if they're looming over their house, um, but there's a lot of technology. It's not just a matter of looking at a tree and seeing that there might be a hole, right? Yeah, well, there's a lot of, uh, and the things that we're gonna learn about it, there's some visual indicators that okay. the homeowners can look on their tree to see, oh, my tree has this, uh, there could be a problem with that. 
uh, but it might not be as necessarily as severe as they might think. Okay. So the purpose of this training today is we brought an international group of speakers to come into Oklahoma and teach us uh, about how our arborists could be better skilled at identifying decay, uh, whether or not that decay is or is not a problem. Right. And we even have uh, one of the developers of the resistograph here. He came all the way over from Germany uh, to here to Oklahoma to teach us a little bit more about that. That's fantastic. And so our basically our arborists who are gonna help us when we have tree damage are learning some of these different tactics to help homeowners. Yeah, we've never had this level of intensive training about tree decay in Oklahoma ever. That's, that's what's so great. That's and, and so now our tree care specialists all across the state we'll be in a better position to advise those homeowners that have concerns about their mm -hmm. trees and they'll just get a level of training on tree decay that we've just never had. And I think that's just really a cool thing. And of course, whenever there is storm damage, we always tell people to find a certified arborist, an ISA certified arborist. Yes. Um, and so this is the training that they are getting, right? So yeah. it's not just somebody with a chainsaw. It's not just somebody with a chainsaw. And uh, so anytime you have any work done on your tree, always uh, make sure that it is an International Society of Arboriculture, ISA certified arborist, because not only they have to take a very intense of uh, uh, test to become certified, mm -hmm. but they have to take continuing education. And this is why we brought this training to and Oklahoma. It, well, Mark, this is exciting for everyone here in Oklahoma. And I'm gonna go check out some of the workshop if you don't mind. No, let's go. joined by Dr. Chris Luley, who is here to talk to us a little bit more about tree decay. So we've got some trees here in Tulsa that experience some decay because of different reasons. Can you tell us what maybe a homeowner should be looking for? Sure. There are some symptoms of decay that homeowners can easily identify. First, they should, homeowners should know that decay is very common in urban trees. In fact, we did a study where there's some 60% of all trees have decay in the lower 10 feet of, of this trunk. So not necessarily concerning if decay is present, but symptoms of decay are symptoms like open cavities, right. as we have on this oak, which is open and obvious, but any size of cavity is usually due to decay. Another good symptom of decay is uh, the presence of wood decay fruiting structures, such as conks or brackets or mushrooms that develop at the base of a tree another excellent symptom of decay. Uh, a, one other common symptom of decay is the presence of carpenter ants because carpenter ants nest in decayed wood and homeowners may see the frass at the base of the tree or carpenter ants, colonies of carpenter ants uh, associated with the tree. And then sometimes homeowners, homeowners can just see the decay, right? right? It's, <laughs> yeah. it's obvious, it's obvious, on, yeah. it's obvious and, and that is a valid symptom of decay. So if they have a concern about a tree that maybe is in their yard, maybe over their house or near it, or even up in branches, right? You can have decay up in branches. What should they do or, or how do you know whether there's potential risk there? Yes. And as I said, not all trees with decay have, have, uh, have concern associated with them. The best approach would be to call a certified arborist that has the skill and the knowledge to do a basic assessment. But in absence of somebody, a professional coming in, we often use some simple tools mm -hmm. to do a, a, a test for decay. One common tool is the a sounding mallet, which right. is a woodworker's mallet that you can tap to listen for that low, dull pitch that is associated with decay. And you can hear it in this tree that when trees have extensive decay, you will have a, a much uh, a much more low pitch associated with Right, that. and you having a trained deer or a certified arborist having sure. a trained deer to be able to detect that. Yes, it's a learned skill. I wouldn't necessarily expect the homeowner to be able to <laughs> yeah. pick a decayed tree out, but someone experienced with a mallet can do a fairly good assessment visually and using a mallet okay. to, to listen for decay to give you a general idea of how much decay is in that tree and if it's in concern and if a more advanced test with a resistograph or tomograph might be okay. might, might be needed. And I know you also have a drill here. What would that be for? Sure. Uh, there's another low-tech way to test test a tree for decay and that's with a small diameter drill bit and we use often use a, a earplug 
to uh, for a depth gauge, oh, okay. and you can so you can probe into the tree where you believe the decay is present, mm -hmm. and look at the wood chips and feel the resistance to get an idea of the thickness of the outer shell of sound wood. Okay, and I'm I'm sure again that's a little bit of a train. You've tapped a lot of trees probably, <laughs> but that doesn't harm the tree or anything, does it? This is you would only want to do this if absolutely necessary okay. because. There are barriers, strong barriers to decay in tree in trees that the tree uses to keep the decay fungus from moving into healthy wood. And if you break that barrier with a drill, this type of drill, you can okay. potentially spread the decay. So it's not something we do without uh, without reason. Okay. But in the hands of a skilled arborist, this can be a valid tool to assess how much decay is present in so a tree. So when we're talking about um, a kind of compartmentalizing of decay, are there certain trees that do that better than other trees? There are, and it really does make a big difference to what kind of tree. Many of the, most of the oak species are good compartmentalizers, but even within the oak species, the white oak species are some of the strongest compartmentalizers or trees that contain decay well, where the black and the red oaks and pin oaks are not as good, but they're better than say many of our maple species, especially silver maple and red maple okay. and some other species that their strategy is to grow faster than the decay okay. rather than to contain it where the oaks grow slower but put a lot of energy into keeping decay in check. Okay, so what about the location of the decay on the tree? Are there certain areas that are more prone or maybe cause more failure? Sure, we see the majority of failures come from the crown just because there's more branches and more locations for decay to be present. But surprisingly, the next common lo location for decay to be present and for failures to occur is at the base and in the root system. And a big reason for that is because that is where trees are commonly wounded mm -hmm. by lawn mowers, vehicles, during construction. And wounds are always entrance points for decay fungi. So the base of the tree is particularly susceptible to wounding and then invasion by infection by decay fungi. Okay, so mm. about decay fungi, like mm. is there a certain one that does it or certain mm. ones that attack certain trees or can you tell me a little bit about that? There's many decay fungi. <laughs> I have a book out on decay fungi. They're, they're somewhat species specific, okay. but the ones that attack trees and decay trees are very specific. And there's, you know, there's maybe um, 500 or so that attack living trees, but only a small handful that are actually important. So many of the decay fungi that decay, that are in trees are not as serious as, as others. So there's only a small handful that can actually actively decay healthy sapwood or wood in the tree and cause them to fail. Okay, and of course, you know, that I mean, those fungi are important, right? Because they're decomposing trees that fall down out in nature. They are. We just don't want them to ruin our trees that are- <laughs> Just like everything else, there's, yeah. good, there's good and bad. So is it concerning the fact that we've got this big open decay hole here and the tree's also leaning? I mean, is that going to cause a off balance there? It's not good, I won't. I won't tell you that that <laughs> open cavity with a parch bench is good, but most trees actually fail when they're loaded by wind forces. Okay. And certainly gravity can cause some factors or some failures, but the most concern is high velocity winds. Which and, we have here and in Oklahoma. And you have all the time in Oklahoma, as we know, and the location of that decay in sound wood relative to that okay. wind load. So it's a misconception by many people that a lean is a bad because of it, it is going to cause the tree to fail. Trees are relatively well adapted to leans in most cases, except when there's extensive decay present as with, with this tree. Okay, so is there stronger wood in this tree or, or weaker wood because of that decay? There is, and wood, uh, depending on which way the load comes, which way the wind comes, mm -hmm. is, of different um, load carrying capacities, which wood mostly is strongest in tension okay. than it is in compression when it's when it's um, when it's compressed or, or or the wind is is forcing it in one direction, and it's weakest when it's twisted. Okay. So one of the best things that we can do for trees is to balance the crown so that load is distributed evenly to the tree when it's loaded with the wind. All right, well, thank Perfect. you for this information, and I think we're gonna go check out some other technology. Great. Thanks.
Thank you. Joining us next is Frank Wren, who came all the way from Germany to show us some technology. So you've got some fancy way to figure out how much decay is in a tree. Can you talk to us about this? And you are also the inventor, I should say, right? Yep, that's right. That's right. So tell us what about, we got here. About 35 years ago, I got the idea from someone presented <laughs> that a needle could help us understanding trees. Mm -hmm. So he said, you should push a needle into the wood and measure the resistance against the penetration. It didn't work, his idea didn't work, so I developed a machine out of that. And that's the machine, we call it resistograph, and it basically drills in a thin needle into wood, measures the resistance, and delivers a profile that shows us the internal condition of the tree. Okay, so it's, is it measuring both the torque that you have to turn it as well as the actual insertion of that? Oh yeah, very, very nice, yeah. Okay. It measures the whole work electrically that is necessary to put the needle into the wood. Okay. That means it measures the rotational and the thrust. So how far into. do you go into the tree with something like In this? In this case, typically 20 inches. Okay. So, but we have a long machine with about 40 inches oh, drilling okay. depth. Okay. But for most urban trees, 20 inches is, is sufficient. All right, well, this seems like a very high-tech method. In what sort of application would we use something like this? Actually, the biggest market for this is inspecting poles, utility poles. Oh, really? Because okay. wooden utility poles typically deteriorate under below ground. Right. And with this machine, you can drill at the base of the pole, find out if there is decay below ground in that pole. Okay. That might lead to a collapse of the pole. Okay. The second market is timber buildings. Worldwide, you know, there are millions of houses built with timber mm -hmm. and timber deteriorates over time and with this you can check without really destroying the timber because the hole is so tiny small tens of an inch approximately so that it's nearly non-destructive and we can find out if there is decay inside or if there are termites inside that eat up the wood okay. and then the next market is urban tree inspection trees like that yeah standing here in parks or along roads where this machine allows us to find out if there is internal decay that compromises the safety or stability of the tree. Okay, so it's not as simple as pulling the trigger though and just no, and not that. it tells you it's decayed or not, That right? would be great. <laughs> that <laughs> Can would be you great. tell me kind of what it actually gives you as a, a printout and tells you? Basically, it gives you a profile along the depth of the drilling that shows the density along the depth of the drilling. Mm -hmm. It reflects the tree rings in that density profile and when the tree is decayed, then the profile drops down and shows, okay, there is deteriorated wood. Okay, so where there's deteriorated wood, that means there's no resistance. No right resistance anymore, okay. no mechanical resistance. And this is shown by these profiles. And the people working with it first have to understand the biomechanics of trees to know where to drill, then how to drill, that means how to operate the machine, mm -hmm. and then how to interpret the profiles and then how to evaluate what this means in terms of safety of the tree okay. so that, that it doesn't collapse and kill someone. Right, this is not something that a homeowner would just buy in order oh, to check out uh, one tree, wouldn't right? wouldn't recommend doing that, no. <laughs> but there are experts even here in Oklahoma, right. um, so practically everywhere, um, that are focusing on that. And fortunately, there are people that really care about trees and get that education. And when these experts buy equipment like that, then it's really helpful. Yeah. First of all, it prevents accidents because they can identify trees that may be dangerous. Mm -hmm. Second, it saves money for the cities caring about urban trees because they know that some trees, for example, even they are obviously defective, they can still be kept in the city. Mm -hmm. So using that equipment properly really lowers the cost for caring about the urban green. Okay, well, Frank, you know, we have a few storms that come through here and a lot of wind. So we appreciate you bringing this technology and training our state arborists here in Oklahoma. Thank you. I enjoy that, thank you. This is Andrina Schufran from the OSU Insect Adventure. Today, we are going to be starting a new segment on bugs, a regularly occurring segment called Bug of the Month. And the first segment today is going to be about the crane fly. <clears throat> Through the month 
of April, you will have seen a lot of these giant things that look like mosquitoes and go by a lot of names. Some people call them mosquito hunters and some people think they're giant mosquitoes. What they're actually is crane flies. And a mosquito is a fly and a crane fly is a fly and a house fly is a fly. But this crane fly just comes out in the month of April and it's very large with long legs, beautiful animal, comes out by the ton this time of the year. Crane flies actually have a very long life cycle. And the crane flies that you see flying around in April are only the adults. And the adults have no mouth parts. When they're larvae for two or three years in the ground, they're eating and growing and eating and growing. And then when they emerge from the soil as adults, they've accumulated all the fat and energy they need for being alive for four weeks. And all they're interested in is finding a mate, mating, laying eggs, and then they've used up all that energy and they die. here at the second half of Scissor Tail Park, making it a complete park. Is that correct? Yes, it is the fully completed Scissor Tail Park, nearly 70 acres. Wow, well, it's exciting. Thank you for having us down here. Joining me today is Maureen Heffernan, who is the CEO and president of Scissor Tail Park. Maureen, tell us what people can find down here at this new lower park. Well, hopefully a lot of people have been to the upper park since it opened in 2019. And now they can discover and have a lot of fun in the lower park, which is the additional about 32, 33 acres uh, right across the Skydance Bridge. So this park has a lot of open space and green space, landscape space like the upper park. But this is more of an athletic park, this, <laughs> yeah. at least this end of the lower park. So we have a soccer field here. We also have four pickleball courts, basketball courts, futsal court, and they are open um, all day long. I think we close at about 11. The nice thing is that all of them are fully lit too. So in the evening, uh, you can come down and play and there's plenty of light. And again, it's open and free for the public. So no reservations necessary. If it's open, you go out there and play. No reservations. There might be some days where you have some special events going on okay. where, where it's closed for, for a special event or a few reservations, but for the most part, it's always open and free to people to use the and, facilities. And it's not all just athletic sports fields either. You've got some other kind of nature areas. Tell us a little we bit do. about that. There's this. a new feature here. Again, we wanted to do just something different from the upper park. and It's a nature playground. We have a wonderful playground in the upper park, but this one is meant to be more nature based. So it's things like logs and stones and willow arches and little tunnels to go under. And we'll be adding a lot more things. But the, the main part of it is for kids to have self-directed play in nature, use their imagination, you know, just get back to the basics. And it's very shady. We've been able to keep a lot of the mature trees, unlike the upper park. So this section really feels more shade and more canopy right away, um, which is really nice. And then right by that, just to the east of that area, is our most landscaped area of the lower park. And it kind of continues the prairie type grass and native flowers that we've had uh, just before Skydance Bridge on right. the upper park. So it kind of jumps over the highway and connects uh, the two parks together with this landscaping theme. So the Scissor Tail Park connects them and that's, what's the distance there between well, the Well, it's really neat. Um, the, our promenade feature connects at the very end of the upper park, which is Oklahoma Boulevard, uh -huh. to the very end of the park here, which is just before the Oklahoma River. So from tip to bottom of the park, it's one mile, it's approximately one mile. Okay. And so it's great for walkers because they can say, okay, I'm gonna walk a mile there, I'm gonna walk a mile back or whatever section they wanna do. It's, it really gets people walking. And I'm a biker, I love to bike downtown. So now I can bike from the start of the upper park all the way to the river trail and connect to it without ever being on the street. Right. So it's really great for people who wanna walk or bike or anything like that. The promenade just continues and it's just beautiful, the views. And at the end of the promenade, at the lower park, at the very south end, uh, there's another hill similar to the one we have in the upper mm -hmm. park. And I have to say, you, if people come to the park, they'll wanna go to the top and enjoy the beautiful views around. It's really stunning. 
in addition, we want to add art into the park. And so our first, one of our first big pieces, it's called the Trash Monster. And it was made by a local artist, Gabriel Freeman. And the message is, we work with Oklahoma City Beautiful on it, that watch where you throw your trash because it could end up in the river. Um, and so it's a, it's a message of reduce, recycle, reuse, and properly dispose of your trash. Well, Maureen, it's definitely exciting to see how active this space is. And we look forward to seeing it grow even more. It is. I hope people come down and experience it because it's a really been a transformational project and it's just unbelievable what it has added to the quality of life for people. Thank you for sharing it. There are a lot of great horticulture activities this time of year. Be sure and consider some of these events in the weeks ahead. If you're looking for inspiration this spring, you won't want to miss next week's sneak peek of the Tulsa Garden Club's annual garden tour, right here on Oklahoma Gardening. And how we've reduced their mowing in order. Spring months, a lot of times are, no, sorry. To find out more information about show topics as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure to visit our website at oklahomagardening.okstate.edu. Join in on Facebook and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. Tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater gem. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Oklahoma Horticulture Society, the Tulsa Garden Club, and the Tulsa Garden Center.